All right, you guys, we're gonna have fun. We're gonna check off a box for Wingman Day for you, but hopefully he sends you away with something useful uh, information-wise. Who wasn't at the opening, the opening ceremony, just so I know who got what information? Did everyone make it the opening ceremony? Oh man! All right. Well, that makes this will be way easier. We'll have time to chat. Um, in my haze of traveling back from Costa Rica, my compute, my personal computer, I found when I opened it up on the plane to get the work done, must have must have survived a crash at some point because the trackpad broke and everything broke. So let's just say. Uh, I was rushing to, to use a bunch of old slides. So we're going to be using some slides I used I, um, I used at a, a speaking event when I was actually back on reserve status in Seattle last year. Uh, so we'll be kind of bouncing around. Um, but it pretty much follows what we used to talk, what we talked about uh, during the opening ceremony, but we'll skip most of the stuff that I've already hit. And now we will have some more fun talking about mountaineering. Um, one of the things I was talking to the last group about was passion. And how lucky I am that at an early age, I, I identified one of my most important passions, and that's being in the outdoors. My mom is not a rock climber or a mountaineer. My dad is not a rock climber or a mountaineer, but they both grew up loving the outdoors. And they shared that passion with me, and it, and it clicked. So here's a little picture of, I think, like seven-year-old or six-year, seven-year-old Rob um, learning to rock climb. And I mean, it's not like I even really had a harness on. I was like on a Swiss seat. But that, in the 80s, you could do that type of stuff, right? Like that was still safe. Um, and, and what was really, what, what, I guess what I was telling everyone is most people know at this time and age what your passions are. Maybe though you don't know how to perhaps turn your passion into a long-term vision or a way to make change in your community or a way to make change in your family or even better, a way to make change in the nation, like whether it be in the squadron or in a bigger picture, right? Because if a second lieutenant can go out there and rattle, rattle things and, and run an international public relations campaign, basically, then you guys can find your own thing, whether it be um, doing web work or being a musician or an artist or a poet or a dancer or a mountain biker or a skydiver. I don't care what you do. There, there can be very, very powerful ways to take your passion and roll with it. And, if, and also keep in mind, you can use your passion in your family. So my parents gave me a little taste of their passion and it became my resiliency tool. Because without the outdoors, I don't think I would have survived high school, let alone um, some of the traumatic things I've been through uh, serving in uniform. So, um, you know, we're gonna, we'll, the, the presentation will always kind of talk about the importance of having that vision. Uh, we did talk about challenge and risk. Do uh, you guys, who, who here got to use those little um, clicker cameras that came in like the little box, right? Like it was a disposable camera? You guys, yeah? Right, and that was the, that thing was pretty awesome, and it was Kodak that was really the people behind that. And Kodak had Kodachrome, and Kodak had everything else cool. Even Paul Simon has a song about Kodachrome. Where are they now? They're gone. They're in the trash can. Uh, their the, all of their uh, patents are, are have been bought up by other people, and, and they don't exist. Why? Because they failed to take risk. They thought that they were they thought they were in a good place, and they didn't need to change. What I tell people is that that often is the same for you in your life. If you think you're just, you've got it all figured out and everything's good, watch out because that wave of, of trouble, that wave of turbulence, the wave of trauma is, is probably, it's going to get you at some point. So if you're not always assessing yourself, looking at how you can change, how you can be better, how can you uh, take your passions and advance them, then uh, eventually you'll either be obsolete in business or you could be um, overwhelmed in, in life. And then uh, one of my most important things that I, I think America needs to work on, and, and I, if we have time, I can get into it later. I've got some slides hidden, but is the importance of proactive mental health and proactive resiliency that, versus the way we often do it in the military, which is reactive. We often wait for a troop to be downrange, to have a traumatic situation, or someone here at home where their kid ends up um, diagnosed with an illness, or they get a divorce, or they get a financial problems, uh, whatever it may be. And then we go, oh, go see the chaplain, or go um, see a resource officer. But why aren't we ever, I think what we ought to be doing is just like you have to get a flu shot. If you don't get a flu shot, you turn up you know, yellow, and then you turn up red, and your boss is like, if you don't get a flu shot, you're busted. Well, why doesn't your boss say, hey, you need to go get a stress inoculation 
right? That's your shot. And in England, they do that, believe it or not. When you are 18 and you join the military, they say, hey, Hagen, welcome. Um, by the way, as a military member, here are a dozen outdoor sports that we have programs of excellence throughout our nation. You can pick one and we'll give you two weeks of permissive a year to go out and practice this and get better. And be every year you get to come back and get better until you get to start teaching people. And then once you're done teaching people and you're kind of like, well, what's next? Then they go, hey, if you want, we'll give you time off to go do an epic adventure. Like if you do 10 years of sailing and you're, you've shown that you're good at it, then they give you permissive TDY to go sail around the nation or to go sail off the coast of South America. Their mentality being when bad things happen to you, instead of us saying, go see the psychologist, they say, why don't you go to the sailing center of excellence down off um, Bournemouth? And there are psychologists there, but there's also activity in a community you already know. That's my dream is that we have something more uh, proactive, forward leaning, and it costs way less money too. Um, but anyway, you already, t you already know how I healed and everything. We talked about the seven summits. Um, and what I, what, I didn't, what I didn't talk about, though, is how in, it was, uh, I was conflicted. Because flying through Albania was some of the coolest flying I, uh, I ever got to do. One day we'd be flying, let's just say so low that the loadmaster was telling us that there was a rooster tail and he was getting wet. Because we were practicing... Um, Low, low visibility ingress, basically um, like trying to get in below even like mar maritime radar. Uh, and then next thing you know, it would be popping up and flying through these mountains and it was just so much fun. And then to have nine people die and leave 11 kids behind and it was my mountains that took them. It was tough because it, it yeah, it was tough because that's my, that was my, that was my safe place, right? That was my resiliency um, recharge area. And yet I've now been around several people and I've, had to help carry out bodies. I've seen my Sherpa die and go out. I was on Mount Aconcagua and saw a man that had three kids just lay down and not get back up. He just had a heart attack at like 18,000 feet. And we watched his, we wrapped his body up in a sleeping bag and we watched the helicopter just take him out on a rope. So what was so interesting to me when Wrath 1-1 crashed was here are my, here's my happy place, but I always have to remember that the happy place can also turn against you. But that's what I like. I guess that's what I like about nature. She always keeps me on my toes. I can't just go in there and let my guard down all the time. Like, yeah, the birds are singing and it's all good, but maybe there's a storm around the corner. And, um, that was an interesting thing for me, though, to think about. And by the way, just this is what this was the ridge line they were just trying to cross, and they were so close to getting it. And if you um, if you ever want to learn more, it was actually it's sad. They were wonderful people, but it was a it's a. What I find with resiliency is we've really got to learn from our, our mistakes just, and our failures. Just like Captain Marion on Everest, when he didn't make it to the top, he was so angry and so upset, but yet now he looks back and he's like, man, what an amazing experience in my life. And with this one, this, was, this is one of the hardest things I've ever had to experience, but I've, I've learned a lot about myself from it. So that's one thing I want people to remember uh, is to not, you know, when you get set back, as long as you can bounce back, the lessons you learn can be phenomenal. And the lessons I learned about communication and teamwork um, and resiliency um, have lasted a lifetime. It's just a, a very high price to pay for such a lesson. All right, so we talked about the seven summits. Um, does anybody have any, well, we can go through and I can ask you, I'll ask you guys questions as we go, but I think a fun way to talk about the actual mountains, which we're gonna go into, is I'll ask you some questions, especially about risk. Uh, that's one of the things I do in Wingman Day is I tell people, get out and take risk, but how are you going to manage it? So that's a fun one we can do on here. Um, one of the things I did want to keep in mind was, all right, the end goal is Mount Everest, and no other team has ever tried to do the seven summits. So what made sense to me was, let's start at some of the easier ones. We were stationed here in England, and Russia, uh, being, being the closest, made sense, and it's also fairly easy. It's it's akin to maybe doing a hard 14er or like uh, Mount Hood in Oregon. So we thought that seemed pretty reasonable. So, you know, the crash of Wrath 1-1 happens. I already had the seven summits plan. Um, what I didn't mention as well was this guy right here, um, Mark Ubaraga was a lieutenant and I was in England and this is actually before the accident in Albania. This guy bangs on my door and he goes, hey, uh, I'm a new MH-53 Pavlo pilot. I hear you're looking for a roommate. And I said, yeah, I'm looking for a roommate. And 
I look on his chest and it says Rainier Mountaineering Incorporated Guide. And it's got ice axes and a rope on his jacket. And I'm like, where'd you steal that jacket? You're a lieutenant. There's no way you're a mountain guide. He was like, yeah, bro, I was a mountain guide. <laughs> I've been up on Rainier something like 27 times. I've done Denali three times. Uh, and, and I said, you've got to be kidding me. Get in here. Poured a beer. And I said, I've got this vision. I've got this dream. But I've never just decided to make it happen. And I told him about the seven summits. And he goes, I want to do the seven summits too. And I said, well, what do you think? Well, let's do it. So we started discussing our plan and we thought it would make sense to, to go from Elbrus to then Kilimanjaro because Kil neither of these are very technical. And then from Kili, we thought, okay, then it would be time. Now you've got some technical ones left. So we go to Kili to Aconcagua and that's pretty rough hiking. But again, you don't need a whole lot of technical skill. And then from Aconcagua to McKinley, which you do need quite a bit of technical. In fact, I think that's harder than Everest. I think it's actually more technical, uh, but I'll get into that a little bit more later. And then Mount Vincent and then ending with Mount Kosciuszko in Australia is like, a, hey, this is our sixth peak. Let's bring in the whole crew and really generate a lot of fun press, low, th low stress, a lot of fun, and then ending in Everest. So that was the way we decided to go for it. And the goal was to do one a year. So it started off uh, two months after the Wrath 1-1 crash. We had spread the word and only the two of us were able to go. But when you've got a cool idea, you, you can't just, you can't always, just like my surfing instructor would always say, he's like, Rob, you can't wait for the perfect wave. Just get out there and catch one. So we said, well, the time's right. We've at least got two people. That's a team. And so we headed off to Russia. What do you guys think would be, if you're going from England to Russia or looking, what do you think some of the highest risks might be? out there. I can tell you one of them has to do with AK-47s. <laughs> uh, this is not far from Chechnya. And at the time that area was still fired up. It's still pretty uh, dangerous. So we knew that the travel out there might be difficult, but all we were doing was from London to St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg to um, Mineral Levody, which means mineral water. And it's a small remote uh, uh, town in Russia and then a seven hour cab ride. Uh, to get dropped off at this little camp here. And British Airways lost three out of four of our bags from London nonstop to St. Petersburg. Not kidding. <laughs> Not kidding. So what, and what's in that gear? All of our technical gear, boots, crampons, ice, things that are very hard to replace, uh, technical clothing. So we just flexed and relaxed and just tried to, um, tried to have fun with it, just like most things. Like, isn't that resiliency, right? Like you land on the plane and they're like, I'm so sorry, only one of your bags is here. You, we could have had a meltdown and just throw in a temper tantrum, but instead it was like, okay, how can we do this? What are we gonna do? And they delivered one bag. We picked up one bag the next morning at the airport. Then we had to get on a train and they delivered the bag to us at a train station in Moscow. And then we actually got the third bag we had already climbed all the way up to here when we, our rented cell phone went off and they said, hey, British Airways finally, and we told them, we gave them almost like a lat long and a name of a ski area. And they flew it all the way to Mineral Vodi, seven hour cab ride, and then somebody was down there with our bag. So we drew straws to see who would down climb from way up high to get some extra gear. And we had rented some backup stuff. but So travel was a hard one. Best story about of all this was, um, it was actually quite scary. We're on that seven hour ride and we're in a really thick forest. And as we're coming around a corner, there's two dudes with AK-47 standing in the road, just telling us to stop. I don't see any path. I don't see any flag markings and the, we were cheap lieutenants. So we had hired a taxi driver that spoke zero English. So he comes to a stop and I'm like, okay, what do we do? We had already identified ourselves as Americans on our, we had to, it's like a, uh, regulation. If you're going to Russia and you're a military member, you must identify. So we said, yeah, we, we're part of the special operations wing and our group and our boss, our, the OSI said, that's all fine the way we did it. So we're like, okay, what's going on? Are these Chechens? Are these rogue dudes? Is this a checkpoint? So they took our passports and went off into the forest. And in the distance, I could see like a little camouflage netting. And then they came back and took out uh, Lieutenant Ubaraga, my buddy, said, you're coming into the woods with us. And that's when you, so again, like you're at this risk management decision, what do you do? Well, there's nowhere you can go. You're in the middle of Russia, in the middle of some forest. No one speaks English. It's not a good idea to try to take a run for it. So he went off 
and I started stressing out. I pulled out every dollar I had in my, or every ruble I had in my wallet, gave it to the driver, and I just said, like, just go. I don't know what's happening, but I don't like it. So the driver went in, handed the leader a bunch of money, and took the passport and left. And uh, I guess we figured that's all they wanted was a bribe. And, but it was really scary. So that, believe it or not, was not the mountain. That was uh, our biggest risk were the people uh, and the transport. But otherwise, the Russians were super friendly. We climbed up over five days, and we actually skied from the summit. And uh, it was very cool. And there's a photo of us up on the top. So what was, what was key about this, and as with most cool ideas that are new, was this was proof of concept. Again, it wasn't the perfect setting. We didn't have a huge group of people. But what was so awesome about it was the BBC ended up covering it. All the local news covered it. Uh, we ended up getting a, a bunch of uh, donations to some charities we were supporting. So I was like, hey, we're getting somewhere. And our special ops group commander, who's now the JSOC commander, General Webb? No, AFSOC commander. Anyway, at the time, he was just uh, a colonel. And he's like, oh, I love this. This is so cool, you guys. So again, I always tell everybody, if you think you have an idea, get out there and just test the water. And if it works, then maybe you keep on going. Um, Mount Kilimanjaro. Another very, a very easy climb, or a hike, I would call it. You can see the trail is no more difficult than the bar trail up uh, Pikes Peak. But what gets you, it's 5,000 feet higher. Um, on this one, we again started spreading the word, but now Air Force Times was covering it. Outside Magazine had just listed us in their top um, 50 innovative ideas or leaders of 2006. So the word was spreading, and we said we can only take 12 people, uh, but we want any any skill set. We don't care what your rank is, your background, anybody can come. So we even got a, uh, an airman that was from New Orleans. And she says, my people don't climb mountains. She's very loud and awesome. And she goes, I was born below sea level. So the idea of climbing a mountain never occurred to me. But we're inclusive. So we said, well, get in here. Come on, let's expand your boundaries. That's part of being resilient. Let's get you out of your comfort zone. So we had to help her get boots, we had to help her get a backpack, we had to help her get sleeping bags. Uh, and we, we headed up, this was a seven day climb. Normally it's six, but we asked for, an, we pay for an extra day to acclimatize. The last day is very difficult. You go from uh, essentially 14 or 15,000 feet to 19. Um, and with mountaineering, your body's like a, a cold rubber band. If you try to stretch it out to its max length right away on one big pull, it's gonna snap. So what you have to do is these acclimatization stretches, essentially, on your body. You pull it a little, and when you hike up in the day, and then at nighttime, you come down a little bit. So you relax it. And then the next day, you pull a little further and relax it. And this is why Everest took 45 days once we'd reached 17 and a half thousand feet. You can't just go all the way up to 29K. You're going to pop the rubber band, and body's not going to like it. So one of, the, one of my favorite things is you see in this photo, uh, the guides got the American, one of the, the guides has the American flag. You have to hire guides and porters and cooks on Kilimanjaro. It's pretty much a rule to get into the park, and it makes sense. It's, it's their, um, you know, make Tanzania great again plan. They basically are like, everyone needs a job, and you guys have the money, so you're going to hire our people if you want to come in. We, we said, we'll just carry our own bags. They said, that's not how it works here. And for like $4 a person, we had a whole entourage of people. It was awesome. But again, here's another one. Uh, what they do is they would argue over who got to carry the American flag. And that was so awesome because so many times we get this bad press image of, oh, people think about America in this poor way or this poor way. Over there, they love the American flag and the dream that it stands for. And I always try to remind people is every morning we're underneath that flag. We've got it on our, sometimes you have it on your shoulders. It's always at the front gate. And we take for granted all the opportunities we have to go out and create amazing opportunities. We, we take it for granted. I mean, with, with this thing, I always say any vision is, a, is, an oppor is out there. Like, there's nothing off the table. Uh, you've just got to basically find your passion and run with it. And we got to the top. It was actually much colder. That was my second time on Killy, so at least I felt like a little bit better about guiding or helping people get up. Everyone made it up, including our New Orleans girl. It was awesome. She barely made it in. There were, there was, most people were crying because she was really struggling. And she came around the corner as the sun was coming up because we, she actually said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall back. I need personal time. Don't, 
don't think you're leaving me because we kept one of the assistant guides with her. But she's like, just give me my space. So she came around the corner as the sun, sun was rising. And oh man, lots of hugs and lots of tears. So all the airmen made it up on that one as well. Um, you know, in between all these climbs, most of our airmen that were coming with us, they were in Afghanistan, they were in Iraq, they were deployed at home, you know, our TDYs all over the place. So it's always something to remember is, it's not like we're a bunch of wealthy, um, middle-aged white men, which are your average, like, high-altitude mountaineers that are, like, going, they have more money than they know what to do with. We're a bunch of young lieutenants and airmen and listed uh, Folks that they just don't have a lot of income but save for it and we're going from combat zone and like, oh man, I hope I get my deployment over in time because I've got that window in Aconcagua I need to make. Uh, but this type of climbing and these views and this energy is what helped me survive. Uh, the poop, anybody been to Kandahar? The poop pond at, at Kandahar, it's like this open pit, bubbling mass of fecal matter and it's hot and it's just, Sad there's you're getting shelled all the time and I remember even at my lowest points in Kandahar <laughs> I would just kind of think about the mountains and the cold air that that's how I that's how I stayed resilient is I at least had something to, to look to that that would lift lift me up um, we had eight or nine we had up to 11 airmen planning on coming with us we had a hardcore group we were actually going to climb up uh, ridge up here, not the not the normal way, and we were going to ski down a couloir. We we're going to try to make it something that like Outside Magazine would really get behind. They said they would, and then things uh, flared up a little bit. A lot of my AFSOC friends and other folks said, I, I can't go. My my deployments are changing, and we said, all right, well, we'll take whoever we can. So just three three airmen. So we cha we we joined up with a bunch of civilians um, to lower our risk uh, because it. Climbing in numbers is often better. Can anyone think of any other risks that you might run into when you're at, you know, Argentina at 22 and a half thousand feet? Huh? 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 Come on, what do you think? Jess. Weather. What was yours? Altitude. Altitude sickness for sure and weather. Those are the top two. So, God, you guys are awesome. So highest peak outside of the Himalayas, they call it the stone, Aconcagua is the stone sentinel. Uh, it, it's very close actually to the shore. Uh, it's on the Chilean-Argentinian border, so it, when the weather changes over the ocean, it makes an enormous change on Aconcagua. And much like going into some medieval combat zone, um, we would be hiking up like in a group like this, and we would see people coming down the mountain just distraught, big bags under their eyes, their gear in tatters, their, their tents literally destroyed. And they've set aside three weeks to climb this mountain, and after one week, they're already giving up because their stuff is just obliterated. The storms up there are fierce, the winds especially. Uh, so I remember hiking with some of our civilian counterparts, and they said, um, boy, maybe we should turn back. I just, maybe it seems like a really bad year to be up here. And you could feel their nervous energy, and we kept telling them, just relax. I think we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to plan for bad weather. We'll take it slow. Uh, but, but watching people coming down dejected and telling us about how scary it was was very easy to give into and almost let them fuel our own fears. But we just kept saying, what's our vision? What is the American flag and the Air Force flag at the summit going to look like? That's what I would kept tell, telling myself, even when I was scared. What's it going to look like at the top? It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. And sure enough, we had only one truly bad weather day where the three of us were all in a tent, like in there trying to hold it up and help it. And we had rocks built up around it. But in the end, um, it was a great summit push. We had 11 total people. Guess how many people made it to the summit? Guess how many climbers made it to the summit? Three. Three. The airmen. Everybody else from all these different countries that didn't have the teamwork. A lot of them were individuals or with a pair. But A, they didn't have a vision. They didn't feel very well prepared. Some of them were just traveling through Argentina and wanted to go hike. Mount Aconcagua, but we had all talked about it. And we had formed a team and we were wingmen to each other. Um, we would help each other when we got sick. Like when Captain Hankel got to the top, he wasn't eating and drinking enough. I didn't notice until it was too late. And on the way down, I noticed he kept cramponing his feet and cramponing his legs and he was bleeding and he was stumbling. And I'm like, Justin, dude, what is wrong with you? And he just, almost like a baby, it was like, almost like saying gaga. He was just saying, gah, da. He couldn't even speak. He was so exhausted. So in many cases, that's when people die at altitude, 
is they've not kept up with water and food and their friends just kind of abandon them or don't take enough care. Me, I pulled out my favorite weapon, which is the goo gels, like, yep, and with the double shot of espresso. I gave him two double shots of espresso. So I gave him four shots of espresso with a whole bunch of sugar. And it's the best way to hit someone fast. It goes right into the bloodstream. His eyes like cleaned up and he's like, hey, let's get down this mountain. <laughs> and we could have easily hooked a rope to him and just had him pull us back down. Um, but by the time he got into his tent, he was out. So it was just, we gave him just enough energy to get down. That's what you need when the going gets tough and the weather up there was terrible, but you need that community that knows they can see you and be like, you're not looking right. Like, let me help you out. So that's another one I always recommend people is find your tribe and make sure they, they get to know you well enough to know when you're in trouble. This was a cool one. Um, 2008, we decided to take, uh, to tackle Denali and Denali is, I was super psyched about Denali because it's America's mountain. And I, I had never been up to Alaska before when I, when I went up with the team. We had a great mix of men and women, airmen and officers. And here's a picture of one of our second lieutenants, no, excuse me, first lieutenant getting promoted on mountain to captain. So we even swore him in and everything in like this little pit and had the American flag out. It's very official. I don't know if anyone else has ever been um, sworn in and above 17 or 18,000 feet with their feet on the ground. I've definitely seen it happen in an airplane. Uh, you know, wherever we went, like I said, American and Air Force flag. Denali is tougher in many ways than Everest because you know, you're getting dropped off down low and you've got to uh, go in, you got to go in with a, um, about 120 pounds of gear a person. We can't carry it all on your back. So you usually put 60 to 70 pounds, 60 pounds on your back, another 60 pounds on your sled, and you take it in a distance. And then after a day, you dig a big hole and you dump in, let's say, 10% of the gear. That's your backup plan. And then you, thank God, there's this thing called GPS. And you mark it with a GPS and put a little flag in. And then you, the next day, you move up to the next camp. It's called the cash and carry method. What you're doing is you're essentially laying siege to the mountain and you're leaving supplies that you probably don't need behind, but if you ever need to, you can come back and get them. And for us, we did have to go back down during big storms, dig back up our holes in the snow and take food and fuel further up the mountain. Um, so I got up to, we got up to about 17 and a half thousand feet and I made a really big mistake. I called, or I called to uh, say hi to work, and that was a really stupid thing, because they're like, ah, they're like, yo, yeah, Captain Marshall, um, we, just, we just got our, an advanced, like a fast notice Warnord, we're taking the Osprey into its first combat uh, ever in Iraq, and we're leaving in less than a week, so we need you back here, you need to be trained up, we'll see you in 48 hours. And I said, I'm at 17 and a half thousand feet, which is actually just on top of this, this ledge. It's Mount Foraker in the background, by the way. And uh, I was like, I can't get back. I, and I'm on permissive TDY slash leave. And they go, okay, well, you have two choices. And this is, my boss was really straightforward. He goes, you can stay on your damn mountain and you can be a part of your own history, or you can come with us and be part of American warfare and his, you know, like the history of combat. And I was like, oh boy, I understand. That's one of those, you don't have an option. And he told me, if you come back after climbing the mountain, the, the building will be empty and you can babysit it for two months. And I said, okay. So I said bye to the team. I went to all the other teams on the mountain because you can't down climb by yourself. Lots of crevasses and dangers. I said, anyone going down? And they said, actually, yeah, we're going to get all of our injured and unhappy people and you can rope up with them and take them down. It's like, boy, double bonus. <laughs> so as I got down to the little airstrip that took us out, the team was getting near the top, but that did give me time to use the sat phone. And I was able to coordinate with a friend of mine that was uh, at Elmendorf. And you know, in 2008, the F-22 was pretty new. So we were able to get an F-22 that was already in the air to go and circle around the summit of, McK of Denali. The weather was bad. So we were the only team to summit that, that day. But, so all the other teams that were waiting for the weather to clear knew we had reached the top because this F-22 just roaring <laughs> around the summit at 20,000 feet. Like America, that is some air power right there. Uh, but it was also really like it was sad. Uh, but I, but the idea of the seven summits was never about one person. It was always about a team and a concept, and trying to get the air force energized. So 
I actually still have to go back. So I'm using this as my, one of my next visions is, and my cadets are really excited. They, want, they now want to become good enough climbers that we can all go back in 2020 is kind of what I keep hinting to them as an option. Uh, it's one of my friends, uh, Captain Van Oosten. She, she had a good, po good pose up there. There's the team at uh, Sunset. So then we uh, rolled into Antarctica. Um, this one was tough because I got a lot of pushback. My uh, first Special Ops Wing commander, um, they signed all of our leave paperwork. We were on the news. Everyone was going, hey, some of you are in Florida. How do you train for Antarctica? And we said, well, we take a sled like, and we put a bunch of rocks and heavy weights in it and we just walk around the track at base, on base, just dragging and trying to get our hips used to carrying a sled. Lots of pull-ups. We'd throw ropes over anything we could see and practice climbing them. You just do your best. We'd uh, walk up and down stairs. Um, but I remember my boss called me in and he said, um, Captain Marshall and Captain Muller, I want you, uh, you need to be in service dress in my office. And this was the day before we left. Another day before we left story. And uh, he chewed our asses. Who do you think you are going to Antarctica? The risk involved is outrageous. And if something happens, do you realize what it'll do to me? Do you realize the newspaper articles I'll have to respond to? And, and it, was all, it wasn't about us or the Air Force. It was about one person and they were worried. And, and after he was done blowing off his steam, that's probably not the right thing to say, but I did say, well, sir, you know you, you signed our leave paperwork a month ago. And, <laughs> and we've also been in the base paper twice in the last two months. And, you know, it just shows what happens when you're a leader and you kind of lose track of everything that's going on around you. But he eventually calmed down. He said, all right, well, I'm gonna, I can't say no now because it'll look bad. But he said, please don't let me down. Please don't let me have me talking about how two of my soft, my special ops wing guys are frozen in Antarctica. We're like, well, we are 100% safe so far. What would make you think that's going to be an issue? So we talked a lot about risk management with him. But again, even though you're chasing your dreams, there's always these roadblocks. There's always someone saying no, saying no, or I'm afraid. Like what you're doing scares me. But remember, it's not their journey. It's your journey. And... If you can convince them to give you some space, you can keep on going. Um, I'll click through this one. This is the best part. It's a four mile long runway. It's just pure ice. This is not where Americans normally fly into. This is an area called um, Union Glacier. And so we flew out on a Russian C-141 ski, as we call it, the IL-76. And the Russians were really good, very professional, dropped us off. Um, I say Russians, I think they were actually Ukrainian. Um, we couldn't afford, any, all we could afford was the airplane ticket. And let's just say the airplane ticket was probably close to like a small college fee. Uh, so there's no way we could have gone with a guided group, but they wouldn't let us on Antarctica unless we had essentially like professional Antarctic experts with us. So we teamed up with a friend of mine that runs a mountaineering club and, or a mountaineering um, company. And we said, if we carry all the extra gear, we shovel out all the tent spaces, we cook, and we're basically your pack mules, can we come with you for like no cost? And they said, okay, we really like what you're doing. So a few of us got to go down and um, carry all the gear and cook for people. And let me tell you, there was a lot of people in Antarctica and on Denali and in Antarctic, and excuse me, all over on all the mountains that do not belong there. Every mountain, I saw so many wealthy people that like uh, coming down from McKinley, I told one guy, I'll set up the tent if you'll start the stove and melt water. And this man had been up there for three weeks on Denali and he didn't even know how to start a stove. Um, there was another guy in Antarctica here, same thing, a very, a very well-known climber and blogger who's been all over from Everest to K2. And, and we had a bad, bad storm. And we're like, hey, we need water. Can someone start the stoves? Again, this person's like, I don't, Everyone makes water for me. I don't even know how to start the stoves. And my attitude was, you shouldn't be basically in the combat zone of mountaineering if you don't even know how to like aim your gun in the right direction. Right? Fire, all you need is to warm up water and you can't do that. And that was really sad. Um, but for the most part, there was a lot of capable people. I also had a lot of fun um, messing around when the weather got bad. This is an example, I think, of cutting loose and having fun, which we need more of. But it's also almost ruined the climb. 
because I went up, we were having a, this blizzard had just, we had just gotten through a blizzard where I was roped into somebody and I couldn't see past this part on my rope. I'd fallen into a crevasse up to my thighs and no one could see me. I mean, I was still roped in and I was able to get back out and keep going. It was, uh, it was pretty close to failure in terms of the mission, but we had enough extra equipment and food and supplies that we made it. And when the storm died down, I wanted to go celebrate. So I went up onto this kind of glacier hillside and I came bombing down in one of our luggage, or one of our luggage um, sleds. But I caught so much air, I bruised my tailbone badly. I mean, it was really painful to walk or stand up. And the next day, of course, we were going to the summit. So I'm a proponent of going out and having fun, but you gotta keep in mind like, how close are you to mission success and what could it do to impact it? So that, that great, that was the photo basically where I'm just about to hit this bump and bruise myself badly, but it was fun. In the end, I'm glad I did it because we still got to the top. There's a picture of one of the climbers, this uh, Captain Moeller. Uh, we did push-ups on the top. We had a 52-year-old guide who was cranking out push-ups with us as well. I wish we could have had a plane fly by. We tried to get an LC-130 from the um, New York National Guard, one of my old mountaineering friends is a pilot, but he said it was too far out of their way. Um, and then we got down and, and got a flight out just as a storm rolled in. The last, the last peak we wanted to do before Everest, again, when you think about risk management, was let's choose the least risky. Let's set the stage for success. Let's not go do something that pe makes people chew their fingertips. Let's go get the easiest of all the peaks so that way everyone has this glowing aura of happiness when it's over and are more likely to approve Everest. So we went down, flew down to um, Australia and invited both um, Australian Royal Air Force and Army members and Americans working at the embassy down there to come join us. Uh, we got a good group. It's very easy. You take a chairlift up and then it's maybe three hours of snowshoeing or skiing, we skied uh, in great weather, and we had a lot of fun. We talked about risk management, we did push-ups. Um, the whole idea was, was let's just get, let's set the stage for success for Everest. And then that leads us to this one. Um, what I didn't talk about were some of the wounded warrior and some of the people that made up the Everest team. So, and I also didn't tell you about having to, who I had to sell it to. Uh, the challenge was not so much the mountain, the challenge was trying to get the Pentagon behind it. Because sure, we could go climb these mountains, but I wanted like the military to get really excited about it. That was the whole reason I started as a second lieutenant. We had already gotten New York Times coverage, we had already gotten Time Magazine, we already got Fox, we already got outside, we're hitting all the public spaces, Airman Magazine and um, Air Force Times, they're all covering it, but I wanted like top-down cover. So I had to meet with the one star in charge of Air Force safety and brief her my plan and she's looking at me like you're telling me the safety director for the Air Force that you want me to approve your plan to climb Mount Everest what are you what are you smoking she was, but she was a jokester she was fun and so she goes okay seriously here's your meet with me in Albuquerque you got 30 minutes to give me a presentation so I I brought this giant old map I put tape all over it and markers and I just gave her a mission brief on it and she asked a lot of hard questions um, and in the end I had no idea, but she goes, well, I wasn't going to tell you, but believe it or not, my father traveled out to Mount Everest in the 70s, and he took photos, and we've always read books, and it's been a family, like something in our family we've always loved, especially because our father loved it so much. So she goes, when I heard about this, I was pretty excited, and uh, I didn't want to give you too much of a hint, but you know, I had a feeling you guys knew what you're doing, because we had six peaks to prove we knew what we were doing. So she gave it the green light push it up to General Welsh. Um, in the end, they said, um, you know, one of the challenges was continue with the Pentagon. Hey, we need 60 days off for this trip. Well, it doesn't fit anywhere in the, we got the whole, it's not in the regs, you can't do it. Same, I was like, ah, I've heard that for seven years now. We've done them all somehow. We've done permissive TDY, we've done leave. All of it's been paid out of pocket. So come on, you can find a way. Well, for every policy, there's an exception. And under the pass and leave reg was exception to policy, must be approved by the A1, which is a one-star general at the time, General Grosso. So we put in our request, told them, and they said, we can't do 60 because sequestration's kicking in, but how about 45? Like, oh, that's, that's, that is more than we could ever ask for. You know, no money, just time off. And then risk. And I would say risk aversion creep kicked in. And 
A couple months later, we get a call. Hey, we can only give you 30 days. The Jags are so. Then we get it. Uh, then we get an email. Um, now, how about 20 days? So they said, we'll give you 20 days. We said, all right, 20 days is fine. It's not great, but it'll work. Uh, we did a lot of articles with safety, ma the safety magazines and the safety team in Albuquerque, talking about how we prepared for it. The day before we left, I got an email from A1 saying, I'm so sorry, but the Jags have reviewed it, and they decided that since no other airmen have had this opportunity, that it's not fair. They said it's just a fairness issue. It wasn't a reg or any... So they said, we're, there's no permissive TDY. I'm sorry. If this cancels your trip, we're so sorry. The day before we left. Well, just like a big resilient airman, we were like, well, we're ready for this. So we had already done all the paperwork to go into leave debt because we planned for up to 60 days of leave. So we asked our, all of our commanders that already pre-approved, if you need to, you can go into debt to Uncle Sam. You just have to pay back your leave. And that is an option. So what saved us on this one, our, our um, research into the leave, and, uh, the leave reg really helped us make sure we could do it. Uh, we raised a bunch of money. This wounded warrior, um, Captain Vivani, was a uh, crow. He, his chute didn't fully open, and he came barreling into the ground, and he got like a titanium, uh, he's got like a, he's got titanium, basically call, we call him Wolverine. He's got titanium throughout his body, and he kind of moves stiffly and slowly. Um, this is a staff sergeant, and he's a stow, like a special tactics, or excuse me, uh, special tactics, uh, STS, what's wrong with me? Anyway, special tactician. Anyway, he uh, got into hand-to-hand -hand combat in Afghanistan, like full on, like bringing out the gun and the knife. And basically someone tried to hit him with a grenade from the side and it messed up, it, man it blew up most of his arm. And so he kind of has to, you know, he moves like this. His hand just isn't equipped, but otherwise he's just super intelligent, even went to MIT. And this is a senior master, Sar or was senior master sergeant at Disney, now chief. He actually lives just down the road from here. And he got shot in the head uh, and face um, on, a, on a soft mission in the Pavlo. So I just happened to know these people because they were outdoorsy. They said they would always wanted to participate. So we raised, in one day, we raised $38,000 because I happened to know the mayor in Amarillo who said, Rob, set aside some time in your work day. Come in civilian clothes, you know, so there's no conflict. I'm going to take you to the top three banks in Amarillo, and we're just going to pass the hat real quick. Well, when the mayor in Amarillo does that, the hat fills up really fast. And, you know, all I know is it was totally legal. And, uh, <laughs> and, our, and, our, and our guys, because it, it didn't come to us, it went to them, right? So they were all paid for to go up. It was super cool. Um, these two ladies uh, were actually one of the, they wanted to be one of the first openly gay female airmen couples. They're both captains. And so they're like, well, hey, you know, don't ask, don't tell is kind of moving around this time. We're going to come with you guys, and we're going to be, we're happy to do interviews. We're going to tell it how it is. So we had such a cool crew of people. Some of them could only go to base camp. Some went to 20,000 feet, and some went all the way to the top. Um, and there's a different picture of just a few of us. We ended up with over a dozen airmen up there. A uh, picture our PJ took. And so here's a picture. After, after about two weeks of all hanging out, we spend the next 45 days on Everest. This is the summit team. And these are people that had been on the seven summits trips in the past and had the, ch the, ch like the experience to go. Because as much as I wish I could bring all of you to the summit of Everest, I knew that it wasn't, it's not safe, right? That's poor risk management. So we did have to eventually whittle it down to people that had the skill set and also were dumb enough to, to spend their life savings on it. This is all of us. This is Captain Marin. Um, the guy that used to work here at Trever, who's up at the academy now. And that's a cool photo of just the wind blowing off of the summit. That's the summit of Everest. And for almost the entire time we were climbing, the jet stream was on it. And so, I mean, it sticks up into the jet stream. So you have 100 mile an hour winds. And what you're doing is you're waiting. You're, you're going up and down and up and down. In fact, check this out. There we go. So, um, this is base camp down here, and it's, this is the Kumbu, the Kumbu Glacier, and it's a big frozen river. It's hard to imagine, but it, you're literally living and walking, sleeping, doing everything along a frozen river because base camp is on the glacier. 
Then, just like most rivers, there's steep parts where there's a waterfall. Well, that's the Kumbu Ice Fall. I remember I showed you the video where everything was. Imagine the frozen river is coming over a ledge, and it, it's frozen in time, except when it warms up, it moves a few inches every day. And sometimes an inch or two will just cause the boulders to come down. Um, so base camp is here, and you work your way up to a camp and then come down. Work your way up to here, come down. Spend a few more days. Go up to here, spend a few days. Go to here, spend a few days, come down. And then maybe you keep doing it several times until camp three is as high as you go to acclimatize. Then you come all the way down and wait here until the weather is right. And then go uh, to here, skip that, and spend the night. Spend a day there. Spend a night here, go on oxygen. Go up to the death zone. This is where the bodies start appearing and garbage because people, it's like a war zone because people know their lives are in danger and they don't have time to, they, they don't give themselves time to clean up. They don't relax. They, a lot of them don't belong up there. So they just kind of, when they get scared or they think they're going to die, they just leave everything, trash everywhere. They just pot, try to bail off the mountain. It's, it's kind of sad. Uh, and then obviously up to the summit. So that kind of gives you an idea of the layout of the mountain. And so this is that wall. You have to actually climb up this wall here. This is where Camp 3 is, around this corner to Camp 4, and then up, on, up to the summit. Covered that. Um, some of my favorite lessons are, and this is more of on a leadership side, but we always try as a community to stay together because that's how we stay resilient as our, as our climbing rope team was let's keep talking, let's have open feedback. It's just like air crew do. If the youngest airman wants to tell the lieutenant colonel pilot that my landing was terrible, there's a time and a place for that. I'm totally open to that. Or if I rushed them, or if I skipped a checklist if I was unsafe, this is where it all happened. Didn't matter who was the leader of the day, didn't matter who had the most experience, we would talk about what was the weather, what was it compared to the forecast, was the avalanche conditions acceptable, um, did someone say a rude thing? Did someone shut down teamwork? We would always talk about it every day, and that made us very success successful. Uh, obviously, uh, personable, that's Captain Marion drinking with the Sherpa. Um, agile, we tried to dress very light, and instead of going slow and steady, what we would do is wait until the time was right, dress lightly, and then zip right through where the avalanches would be coming down or through the Kumbu Icefall. We were passing people all the time. The goal being, let's use a lot of energy and limit our exposure to risk. And it worked out, uh, it worked out great. Okay. That's a view from Camp 3 up on that, that steep ice face. Looking down, that's Camp 2. Camp 1's right there and base camp's behind, or is underneath the clouds. And that's a picture of us. Um, we got up to Camp 4. Look at all, do you see, notice all the trash everywhere? Um, there was literally a body 150 feet over there, just hair and clothes sitting out, and somebody left them. I mean, what type of wingmanship is that? It just, the fact that people would go and climb this mountain and then just say every man for themselves and leave their friends, it blew my mind. We all agreed we would just, it would be a disgrace if we ever did that to ourselves. We, it was just not in our cards. Although, even though we say not every man for himself, notice there's only five people there. Normally we climb with the six. Guess who is in the tent? Getting their beauty rest. The F-16 pilot. <laughs> he wouldn't come out. Colin Marin, he is not looking too good. He is sick as a dog here. He's on multiple antibiotics. He's just doing his best to try to stay with the team even though he feels terrible. And our guy is sleeping in his tent. We kept telling him to get up. It's history in the making. And he's like, nah, I don't want to have to get my clothes on. So that was the photo. There's the, you saw that photo earlier, success on the top. I will say, after being told no so many times and being worried about all my teammates and everything, when I finally climbed up the Hillary step and there was no one around us, because actually, it's a totally different story, but for risk management, we unlatched from the one safety rope five different times to pass, to bring out our ice axes and climb around slow teams because we didn't want to get stuck burning energy and oxygen and fuel. So, you know, fuel being uh, calories. So we had got up to the summit with almost no one around us. And the moment I saw it, I, 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 I wept. I mean, I was obviously hypoxic and emotional, but it was really cool to see eight years of a vision come true. Um, I called a colonel who's been, who's our helper, who then called the one star, who then called 
General Welsh while you're on the top. Then I tried to call my parents and I was way too hypoxic and emotional because I think I had just done the push-ups. And so I was then trying to talk to my parents, absolutely hypoxic, and I was, I was crying up there too. Just screwed up. And they're like, are you okay? And I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and then they're like, did you make it? Uh-huh. And they're like, all right, we love you, get down. <laughs> and we saw those. Um, and we went through a bunch of these slides. Here's a cool part. Um, this is General Maggie Woodward. When she was a one star, she was the Air Force Chief of Safety. And so she was the one that I had to pitch it to. And she became our main supporter. She was our cheerleader at the Pentagon, always fighting to try to keep us uh, in the permissive TDY loop, always fighting to, to keep us in front of General Welsh's image or in, in front of his uh, radar. Well, when the climb was over a few months later, General Welsh and Chief Cody came into her office and said, Maggie, close the door. And they said, so we've got an opening in the Sapper office and we're elevating it to a higher, the Sexual Assault Prevention Response Office and we need some GO power in there because I believe it was an 05 that ran it before and got arrested for assaulting somebody in a parking lot, if anybody remembers that. It's a real mess. So they said, we want to elevate this to a, a rock star. Well, she was a rock star. So they said, okay, you know, we're tapping you. And I remember her talking to me after the climb, and I said, ma'am, so how's this job? Like, you're in charge of Sapper for the entire Air Force. How do you tackle this problem that's all over the news and pervasive throughout our culture? And she's like, oh, I'm lost at times. I'm just, it's overwhelming. And me, I don't know, maybe it's because I just got done with Everest. As a major, I wrote her this really inspirational letter of my vision. And how do you have a vision and tackle things bigger than yourself? But we talked about Tackling her problem was just like tackling a huge mountain. You may not know the way to the top yet, but you know what it looks like up there. You can imagine what the answer is going to be, right? Everyone treats each other with respect. Sexual assault goes down to basically nothing, and reporting is really easy. She's like, yeah, but I don't know how to get there. And I said, well, that's how we are at mountaineering. So it was funny. She's the one who helped me get up Mount Everest, but she said she took that letter I wrote her, and she pinned it up on her wall, and that was her reminder that if these younger airmen can make it up a big mountain like Everest, I can tackle the sapper problem. And she, she kicked some butt until she retired, and now she's riding horses in California. Um, I'll skip all these. We already talked about the risk part. Really, you've got to get out there and take risk, even if it's going on a date. I'm not kidding. It could be as simple as going on a date or telling your family you love them or uh, deciding to go to the gym if you haven't been in a long time. That's all risk of different levels. And the you got to get you got to get the ball going. Um, we talked about that, and then I think we can wrap it up with um, you know talking about what is your vision or how do you guys want to challenge yourself. If you want to share it, I find that's one of the most powerful things. If someone's like, you know what, this is what I want to do, because then everyone else is like, oh, that's a great idea as well. Um, if anyone wants to share that, that's great. Or otherwise, you know, I'm open to questions as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, by the way, this, and this is what um, we decided, what do we do after the seven summits? How do we make it more accessible to airmen? I decided, well, America is awesome, so let's do the 50 summits challenge. We started it a long time, like in 2000, in 2014 we started this, and actually many of the states are complete, but it's always open to airmen, it's not as, we're not doing it as often, but the idea being, let's say you're from Montana and you love the outdoors and now you get stuck in Mississippi, well, what do you do? Well, they have a high point too doesn't have to be an Everest or a Kilimanjaro. You can always find an excuse to get outdoors. So we tell them, find the highest point like Guadalupe um, and go hit it or go, um, what's our 14er here? It's um, Elbert, right? Yeah, so go to up to Elbert. We have a photo of 70 airmen up there. We took a ton of Air Force Academy cadets and two of their independent teams all got up to the summit together. So it can be done. All right, anybody got questions on it or? You may want to, sh what do you got back there? So I have a question. Um, did, you actually, did anyone on the team actually uh, try to go up to the top like on actually this battle action? Was that kind of an Everest assessment? Of yeah. Never do that? It, I would do it, but only on the second time, right? The first time up Everest, it would be why go into an area of unknown quantity, right? You don't know what the conditions are like or the experience like. So why not go up using all the tools you can, including extra O? And then maybe if you want to go back a second time, then I think now you have that, what's even better, now you have the vision, you know what the mountain looks like. You know all the checkpoints instead of just kind of wandering into 
the abyss. So I always, I told everybody, I don't want anyone on, uh, off of supplemental oxygen. And we all agreed supplemental made sense. And then the best part about it is it keeps you warm. It like helps um, dilate your um, extremities and capillaries. And so it actually really increases the blood flow out to the areas that are the coldest. That's the best part about it. And I'm proud to say that not a single member of our team used more than 50% of their oxygen. So that was pretty cool too. Jess, did you have a question? Was there a point where you thought you weren't gonna make it? That's a good, that's a, I get that question sometimes. There was only one point where I thought I may not make it and that was probably like day four. I got the Kumbu cough. So I got a dreaded dry cough and it got worse and worse. And I started trying to take inhalers I got seen by the ER at uh, Everest Base Camp because I was starting to cough up a little bit of blood. I mean, more like from irritation. And I would even cough to the point where I had like vomit. Um, and so anyway, in the end, uh, I found a way to manage it. Uh, but when I did finish, I had a split rib. I, they said I had a separated rib from coughing so hard. But once I got past the pain, I, I knew the mountain had invited me, so I knew I'd make it. Any other questions? Who, does someone else have one? All right. We're right at 11.45, so I think we got it all well.